Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. And today we're discussing the very latest innovations in breast cancer diagnosis and treatments with our guest, Victoria Volochko Smart, Senior Vice President of Mission at the Susan G. Komen Foundation, Gene Sachs, CEO of Living Beyond Breast Cancer, and Dorothy Gibbons, co founder and CEO of the Rose Center for Breast Excellence. Thank you so much for joining us. I am just thrilled, thrilled to have you here. One of the things that that has affected me in my life and the people around me has been uh, this uh, idea now of living with breast cancer, treating breast cancer, finding breast cancer early, whether it's uh, my daughter, my wife, uh, my elder uh, relatives, my friends. It seems to be such a ubiquitous uh, condition with one of eight women um, uh, affected by breast cancer, and it is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in American women. So we're we're so happy to have uh, you, Victoria, Eugene, and you, Dorothy, to guide us through this discussion. So let's talk. Let's start off with you, Victoria. Um, can we, can you just give us a sense? of where you see the state of breast cancer treatment, diagnosis, and the work that still needs to be done. And we're going to go around the room. We're going to go to Jean, and then we'll go to Dorothy and really get a sense from the experts of where we are and where we need to be. Okay, so let's start with the good news first. So the good news is because of all of our work in advocacy, our focus on early detection and the research that has been done to put new therapies on the market, we've seen a reduction of more than 40% in the mortality rate in the past 40 years. So that's the great news that breast cancer is becoming more survivable than it was back when we started talking about breast cancer publicly back in the 80s. But the challenge that is still before us is that there are nearly 45,000 people who will lose their lives to breast cancer this year alone. So our work is not done. And primarily, the people who are losing their lives is due to metastatic breast cancer. That's breast cancer that has outsmarted the very best that we have on the market today. And this is the tragedy that we're facing, that you can do everything right once you're diagnosed with breast cancer, but yet the breast cancer gets ahead of our therapies. So this is where we need to focus our attention on addressing the breast cancers that kill but also ensuring that all people receive the right care at the right time. And this is where we need to talk about those communities that are experiencing health inequities. And I know we'll talk about that a bit later. You know, this is such an important uh, idea. First of all, that we have made progress, but there's so much progress still to be made. And this idea that, um, that no matter what you do, until we have the medical treatments and the medical research in order to address this proactively, um, you could do everything right and you might still be in that category, right, Jean? Yeah, I think Victoria did a great job of, of you know, setting this up. And I think I just want to add that, you know, breast cancer is complicated. Um, and I've been told over and over again by the best medical oncologists that it is the most complicated of all the solid tumors. And so when you're diagnosed with breast cancer, you have a lot of decisions to make. It's very overwhelming. And as we get more targeted treatments, and I know we'll talk about this, genomic testing, genetic testing, subtypes, other um, proteins that may be overexpressed, um, there are a lot of decisions to make. And that is hard for anyone, but very hard for those populations that have less access, lower literacy, um, live in rural communities. Um, so they that is where organizations like Living Beyond Breast Cancer and Komen and the Rose Center really can step in and help. So I think we're at a, at a really exciting time with breast cancer that as the fun, as we go from breast cancer here, like everybody has breast cancer to what subtype, what 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 is your genomic, your genetic testing, and your it's like this funnel. Um, so we have more targeted treatments, but we don't have enough for everyone. Um, so that means some breast cancers are more treatable than others. And that is, that's challenging when you're diagnosed. And, so and, there's a lot to say. <laughs> and of course, your environment has, has an impact. And not only that, but 
uh, what cohorts you belong to by race, ethnicity, by um, uh, um, uh, uh, ancestry. Uh, right, Dorothy? I mean, you've got so many different factors. We don't really know what is all contributing. We see um, a correlation of statistics, but we really don't know what the causes of these conditions are. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Your biggest risk is being a woman. And we all know men get breast cancer, too. In my world, remember, I'm on the the imaging side, the prevention side, which I hate that word. There is no prevention. Right. It is only finding it a little bit earlier. And you know what we see? The Rose has been doing this for 37 years. And the difference I see, of course, is in the better technology we have, the advancements there, and of course, in the treatment. But the thing that stayed the same is the uninsured don't have access. Certain communities don't have access. And I cannot believe after this much time that for the last seven years, the only women that we have diagnosed with stage four breast cancer have been uninsured. Now, that's incredible. We diagnose 500, 600 women a year. That, to me, is just the most uh, unbelievable and, and unacceptable stat that we've got out there right now. Well, and Dorothy, you- just to clarify, what you what you mean is that you're diagnosed metastatic de novo. So off the bat, you've never had early stage, right? Because Not with, no, in right. that group. Now, in, it, we serve insured women too. So I have the perfect comparison if you want to really look at it. And, you know, it's only in our, our mobile screening where you see that it didn't matter if you were insured or uninsured. But boy, once it, it gets beyond that, then it matters a lot. There, there are two aspects of this particular condition that um, I'd like to ask you about. One is what you what you've raised, Dorothy. And I'm going to stay with you uh, for a second, and then we'll go to Victoria. Um, this this idea of wealth equating to health, right? This idea of having the means to uh, to get early um, uh, early diagnosis, imaging, and so on and so forth, um, and that basically determines your lifespan which is just, to me, insane, because I could, by an accident of birth, be born um, with a different income level or having grown up with a different education. All of a sudden, I'm dead early simply because I don't have access to essential treatments. But the other aspect I'd like to stay with you, Dorothy, is, is the change in sensibility. I was born in a hospital, um, but the, the obstetrician who delivered me was a man. My mother didn't have much choice. She came in, she was uh, put under, she was unconscious when I was uh, when I was born. And in listening to the stories and juxtaposing it today to the stories that I hear today from my my younger daughter and and how women are treated and how the medical establishment has has shifted. Um, It seems that there's been a beneficial impact on such conditions as treatment of breast cancer. How do you see that working in terms of how the whole treatment and medical establishment has shifted and needs to continue to shift in order to ensure that the consciousness of how to treat, how to consider, how to research is more aligned to the needs of women, specific needs of women, as you said, uh, uh, Dorothy, right? Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Mark, we've got a long ways to go on that one. <laughs> okay. A long ways to let's, go. Let's but talk about I will it tell I'm... you, yeah, I, I do believe this, and I've heard physicians in my world say this that since COVID, people are a lot more curious. They're going to ask more questions. So I think everything that Victoria was talking about with, we finally got some awareness out there. And I do mean finally, because there's many communities that still don't have that. But but on that broad, broad general awareness, it's out there. But oh my goodness, when when it comes to what else needs to be done, we've just barely touched it. But let's get down to specifics. You're talking to a guy now who okay. might have some attitudes, right? What do I have to, how do I have to think different? How do we all have to think differently 
about that in a way that benefits civil society, that a way that benefits women, the way that benefits people who are not exactly like like me. How how can I shift, Dorothy? And then Victoria, I, I'd love to. I see you smiling, so I know you have some specific idea. But what do I have to change? You know, I think it's I think it's society as a whole. I don't think it's just men. Let's let's don't make this a gender thing, please. But I think we have to remember we weren't even doing research on women for a long time in the in the diseases that are impacting everyone, heart disease. If if it had not been for the the pioneers like Komen uh, and you know Jean and what she's trying to do, people would still not be talking enough about it. So, Victoria, t- take it from there. I'm I'm afraid I'm going to get into the those biases that I have, yeah. and that might not be might not be the best. Oh, thank uh, thank you, Dorothy. Um, you know, it's a really interesting question, and I think there's a lot to unpack with regard to the delivery of healthcare itself. And in my view, what's becoming more needed is viewing healthcare as a partnership between the doctor and the patient. You know, in the in the early days, um, even looking at breast cancer, someone was diagnosed, someone told you what the treatment plan was, and you accepted it. But that's no longer the case. As Jean said, there are, are a lot of decisions to make now with regard to your breast cancer care. A lot of things that will help you today, but will also impact your tomorrow. It's a lot to explore. And we need to go into that as a partnership between the physician, the healthcare team, and the patient. But the truth is that's not common in every healthcare setting. And it's definitely not as common in a healthcare setting where our communities of color are being treated. There is a raft of information and research out there about whether patients are even offered the same standard of care, being offered the same options, being listened to, being heard, understood, believed. There's a lot of this that we have to think about in the delivery of all care, not just breast cancer care. And I think that's how, you know, when you're asking, how do we have to think about things differently? It's really about thinking about the patient as the driver in healthcare. But I also want to address what you talked about, about the financial impact of healthcare. And really, survival is not just something that's between the rich and the poor. So I want to think about, want us to think about, you know, the, what was in the media, you know, about Serena Williams when she had her baby and the way that she was treated at the healthcare setting. You're talking about one of the most famous powerful and wealthy women of color, but yet she still felt that she was not treated equitably or respectfully in the healthcare setting. And if someone like that is not receiving the same standard of care, it's really not about money. And so we have to really unpack how people are being presented at the healthcare system and have honest conversations about bias and about racism that goes hand in glove with with today's society. Um, The other thing I'll say about uh, expenses is in the United States, we are the most expensive country for cost of breast cancer care, the most expensive. So even at the very earliest stage, because of the Affordable Care Act and because of the PALES Act, women 40 and over should have free screening mammograms every year um, if they're covered by insurance. But the financial problems start because screening only tells you if something is wrong. It doesn't tell you what actually is wrong. And so the cost of that diagnostic doesn't come for free in most states and across the country because uh, healthcare insurance is different, whether you're on a national plan or a state funded plan. That could be anywhere from $250 to several thousand dollars to find out you have breast cancer. And for many everyday Americans, that amount of money is just simply out of reach. And so at the very beginning of your breast cancer journey, we're introducing financial barriers that have a direct correlation to poor outcomes from breast cancer. So, you know, organizations like Coleman and my colleagues, we provide that financial support to help women and men overcome those financial barriers. But in a perfect world, we would have the policies that would provide that coverage equitably to everyone. So that's a very long answer to your short question, but there is a lot to unpack. 
Bean, uh, could you comment on on this, in particular, the the work that you do to fill some of these gaps at Living Beyond Breast Cancer? Um, you know, it's there's a partnership in which, in a sense, organizations like yours are taking the lead because the uh, the funding structures that we have do not allow others to take the lead. It's actually being done on a voluntary basis through contributed revenue through nonprofits like yours. Talk a little bit about how you see your attempts to solve some of these issues that are, that were mentioned by Dorothy and Victoria. Yeah, these are, these are big issues. We could just focus on one. I just want to add a couple of statistics that I think are important to keep in, in mind. Less than 2% of medical oncologists in this country are Black and even fewer are black surgeons. So the likelihood of a black woman encountering um, someone from her ethnicity is really small and even smaller depending on where you live because they're the black prof healthcare professionals are gonna be more on the East Coast, the West Coast kind of not. So we already know um, that there that is an issue. If you're not meeting with a doctor, a healthcare provider, who you feel comfortable with and who can relate to your situation, um, that sets up a challenge. So, and that doesn't mean, I mean, it's- And this isn't a liberal conservative thing, right? No, this, this, is, this is just, we have a long practical. way to go. Yeah. Yeah. So we, you know, we do a lot of things. Komen does a lot of things to, you know, we've focused a lot on the black community because they, black women die at a 40, over 40% 40 higher rate than white, white women, which is completely unacceptable. And we don't really know why. I mean, we used to focus on social determinants of health and they don't lack of access and lack of money, but actually we are now learning that black breast cancer may actually be different and we haven't studied it enough. We haven't run the clinical trials. And there's some amazing organizations out there that we partner with um, who are really pushing this issue. We do specific programs for the Black community. So, you know, certainly if you're Black in America, your outcomes are worse. Um, and that has to be addressed. As Victoria said, we've made some gains. Other, you know, white women are doing better. Um, we've, we're also screening more women. So part of the reason the statistics are better is we're screening and diagnosing earlier. Um, but it's that metastatic, uh, diagnosis that is complicated. It's hard to treat. And, um, when we get into the new therapies, we can talk more about that. Well, let's, let, let's talk a little bit about those, those therapies, but, um, just, just to wrap this up, um, uh, could you just go around the go on the the uh, the table very quickly, uh, staying with Jean and then going to Dorothy um, about how you provide information, just just knowledge, just empowered through through knowledge. Uh, and, and let's just do it very quickly. Jean, could you just describe um, what you do in that area of informing people? Yeah, so Living Beyond Breast Cancer all, is all about information, education, and support. So you can go to our website, lbbc.org. There's 12,000 pages of content, finding information. We do a conference on metastatic breast cancer. We do regular webinars and ask the experts. We have a helpline for peer-to-peer -peer support. We provide financial assistance grants. So many, many ways. We truly believe in order to be do well with breast cancer, not only do you need to be informed, you need a community. And those are the things that we seek to provide. And Dorothy, I'm, I'm looking at your website as well. Very, very rich in terms of content. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mark, we are, of course, on the other end and primarily doing the direct delivery of services. So we're doing mammograms and ultrasounds and biopsies and physician consults. And, and uh, you know, one of the programs we have is mammogram to medical home. And that's where we're, we're doing it backwards. We're bringing that woman in and having an NP look at her and then getting her to a medical home because <clears throat> so many of our uninsured women do, not they don't have a doctor, period. Right. I mean, it's just, they don't even know where to go. So I think, I think uh, many of our programs have been copied, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, throughout the nation, but we are primarily in Texas, the toughest state around for women. And, um, so, yeah, 
Well, and you need tough women to to uh, work in a tough state, right? I mean, that's. Oh, I, I tell you, when Victoria talked about policies a while ago, let's don't get going on that. Good heavens. Well, we can make we can make another show of that, and we should, by the way. But um, uh, Victoria, one of the things that I really, really love about the DNA of the Komen organization is that is this idea of gatherings as being a form of knowledge exchange, community building, uh, fundraising, empowerment, um, and that's part of your DNA as well. And uh, but but over the years, I've seen you evolve as an organization to have an, uh, to have to take that and then create a whole bunch of different threads that that really ensure that people come away from your uh, events or even if, even if they don't experience your events they come away with information could you talk a little bit about how you disseminate that information Thank you for that question. Yeah, Susan G. Komen uh, definitely has had a commitment to meeting people where they are. And Jean talked about this too, that that the power of that community and being a force for driving education to action. We want to teach women what they need to know so that they can go forth and do those things to protect their health, like knowing their family health history, getting screened and making the right decisions if they are diagnosed. Um, what I know you're referring to the thing that Coleman is known for, which is our Race for the Cure series, which is now known as our More Than Pink Walk. And it really is an opportunity to bring those educational messages right where people are in a setting where they're surrounded by people that they love and they trust We've talked about that, too, about becoming and being known as a trusted provider of rigorous evidence based information that people can rely on. That's really, really important. But the sense of community is very important to the movement for breast cancer. It's very isolating to receive a diagnosis, but to be surrounded by thousands of people who understand what your journey is. That's very impactful. It's very healing. You know, you, you've talked about this as being a fundraising event, which it is, but I like to think about these events that all of us do as really a gift of healing to our community to come together, be surrounded by support. That's also a very key part of your healing from breast cancer. And agency, agency, right? The ability to take control, control. Right. right. You know, to be empowered against something that has left you so powerless that you can come together, that you can be a united force. You can raise funds. You can raise awareness and education in your own circle and feel like you are making a true impact against something that has left you feeling so unempowered. So staying with you, Victoria, and then Gina, we're going to wrap up with with Dorothy since we're coming to the end of our half hour. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, from each of your perspectives, the most hopeful research threads and the most hopeful treatments that are coming down the pike. Victoria? So the name of the game in treatments is really that precision or personalized medicine. The big thing that we've learned about breast cancer is that it is not just one disease. Um, there's really no woman watching today who doesn't know that one size does not fit all. And that is very, very true about treatment from breast for breast cancer. You know, and, and Jean and Dorothy, we both talked about this, you know, really understanding your genetic and genomic profile. That's huge for us in breast cancer. In my opinion, every patient has the right to know their breast cancer and all of the factors that make up that breast cancer that help their medical team create the right precision targeted therapy for them. There's been an explosion of new therapeutics on the market that are addressing this. But a lot of what we're talking about today that has a lot of excitement is in the realm of immunotherapy that are sort of you know, the exciting gold standard for targeted therapy. I've been in the research field for 25 years now, and I can tell you back in the day, um, immunotherapy was thought to be crazy for a cell a tumor like breast cancer. Well, because of uh, developments in science, that's no longer a case. And this has been completely or um, specifically important for an aggressive form of breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer, for which there was no known target for therapy 
until a new immunotherapy came on the market. This has been a game changer. And now scientists are looking at whether this same approach can be used for other types of breast cancer. The last thing I'll say about immunotherapy and triple negative is this ties this back to our fight against health inequities. Black women are more often diagnosed with this aggressive form of breast cancer called triple negative. And now we have a therapy on the market that could be specifically helpful to this community that has often been left behind in clinical trials. To me, that is a huge win and really exciting for the future of breast cancer therapy and really exciting for patients. So I'll stop there and pass the baton to my colleagues. Jean, uh, where do you see the development? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, breast cancer is not one disease. Precision medicine is is real, it's happening, not just in breast cancer, but it's what everybody, the whole world needs to know about. You know, you need to do a lot of additional testing to figure out the best treatment for you. I think um, immunotherapy has done really well in some of the other solid tumors. Breast cancer has been a little bit slower, but we're hopeful, but we have, we are finding more and more targets, both for triple negative, as well as HER2 and ER positive. So, um, you know, there, there's more coming. Um, we're, we're waiting for um, yeah, kind of the, what immunotherapy is. Yeah. I mean, immunotherapy is, you know, really um, galvanizing your immune system to um, it's what we do with vaccines, right. To fight disease. And um, it's a, it's a fascinating um, way to approach, but with, with breast cancer, it, it isn't, hasn't been like a total game changer yet. Um, it, it doesn't seem to have the same impact as it ha is having with lung and melanoma. But nonetheless, you're right, with, tri with triple negative, um, we have some therapies that are working. I think for me, I'll just go back to what is most exciting. I've been in this space for over 30 years, um, just even though it's a smaller group, but what genetic testing has done in terms of giving women the ability to make proactive decisions if they are they have a known gene mutation. So remember, we all have the BRCA gene. It's just whether you have a mutation on the BRCA gene. Um, and there's others as well, but that's the, the biggest impact. And to be able to do prophylactic surgery um, and other things to prevent and do pre-gestational testing so you're not carrying this on to the next generation. Um, so to me, that is still a small group. Remember, less than 10%. But for that group, um, stopping breast cancer in, it, in their tracks in families that have been literally decimated by this disease um, is really over. It's it's incredible. So that's ex that's one of the most exciting things. Thank you so much, Jean and Dorothy. Can we give you the last word? Well, and mine's very practical. You know, to me, the most exciting thing is that women are talking about it, that we have platforms to talk about, that we aren't afraid to ask, and we are insisting on answers. I mean, that at the end of the day is what is going to continue to push the research and continue to push push the policies. It is insisting on the answers. It's being empowered. It's it's uh, driving research by the priorities that women have, um, and it's it, it's it's uh, pushing back that sort of uh, veil of ignorance, uh, either amongst people who don't know about testing, uh, creating community, sharing uh, knowledge, and being empowered. Uh, Dorothy Givens, co-founder and CEO of the Rose Center for Breast Cancer Excellence. Victoria Volotsko, a smart senior vice president of mission of the Susan G. Coleman Foundation, Gene uh, Sachs, CEO of Living Beyond Breast Cancer. Thank you so much. I, I want to personally thank you for uh, evolving my own knowledge of this really, really important area and uh, all hope to also the fundamental researchers who are trying to identify the causes of breast cancer that, that you are treating. Uh, please thank your boards. Please thank your staff. Please thank your donors. Please thank your communities. And please thank the empowered women who are fighting back against breast cancer. Thank you so much.